Thank you all for, for jumping in. Um, you know, I think Rahul put it best earlier when he said, in a few years from now, we're hoping to look back at a panel like this and wonder, how could the room be so empty with, some, with such exciting stuff being discussed? So thank you for being here. Thank you to my panelists, uh, Mark Greck, Stefan Kovac, and Robert Montgomery. Um, the three of us today, we're, we're going to be talking about the Web3 uh, Web space and how it relates to the casino world as a whole. So first, I'll let, uh, I'll let the three of you, I think you guys know enough about Stefan at this point, but uh, I'll let Mark and uh, Robert introduce themselves and then we'll dive right in. So Mark, why don't you go ahead? Sure, thank you. Um, so yeah, basically um, I'm founder of Broadmark 365 where eventually I help uh, businesses get into emerging tech uh, with a disruptive way, I would say, across the product marketing uh, sphere. Helping uh, people understand emerging tech itself, if it's Web3, AI, um, and obviously nowadays we have a whole lot of blockchain technologies over the horizon, metaverse. Um, but yeah, that's me. Hi, everyone. I'm Robert Montgomery. I'm an investor, an entrepreneur focused on gaming, tech, and content, in effect. Uh, I got involved in looking at Web3 and blockchain uh, probably eight or nine years ago and have been very interested in, in that space as a parallel universe to the regulated gaming industry, which I'm also involved in. Uh, I'm an investor and uh, chairman of Gameco Green Jade Group uh, and involved in a couple of other businesses in the regulated gaming space. So I find this panel and its subject to be extremely interesting to explore. So, you know, it's And you know, I, I find it funny that you talk to most people, anybody who's involved uh, in, in blockchain and crypto and uh, Web3 space, almost anybody who you talk to has been involved for, for years, uh, and yet the market itself is really only starting to hear about it more on the public side. So I guess with that, uh, we'll start looking at some of, the, some of the ways that the market has actually started to use it. I'd be curious to know, we'll start with you, Stefan, about uh, current initiatives that have, or current applications that we've actually seen Web3 uh, get involved in the casino space, in the regulated gaming space. How exactly, whether it's on the marketing, the product side, where have, where have you started to see Web3 get uh, more involved in, uh, in the casino world? Yeah, I guess, I guess casino, kind of gaming, broader gaming, 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 whole, gaming sure. world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's disappointing the, the, the extent, to be honest with you, that, that we, we, we've kind of seen it being implemented. And I think there's other industries where they're much more forward in terms of experimenting. An element of that, which I'm sure we'll touch on, is probably around regulation. But I don't think that's entirely the case. But I think, you know, something, some, someone like DraftKings, obviously, have kind of come in. Um, and they have their marketplace, their NFT marketplace. They have their Rainmakers, their, their fantasy product. Um, so they're kind of experimenting with, you know, the, the, the original marketplace selling sports styles. I think the deal was with uh, Autograph originally and Single Wallet. And they've got their sports betting consumer base so there's a clear kind of parallel there the you know the fantasy based game again sport there's a clear parallel with kind of sports betting and you know extending that product line uh, and I, I think you know for me well actually before we look at further things other people who are doing interesting things are probably slightly more outside of the regulated markets sure. should we say in the in the slightly grayer markets and I think we're beginning to see um, some kind of experimental use around NFTs um, when it comes to kind of loyalty, also in terms of acquisition. Um, uh, so using, uh, both using NFTs to create kind of programs and marketing uh, activities, but also working with communities that already exist. Um, one could argue a lot of these NFT communities kind of are gamblers at heart anyway. Sure. <laughs> and so kind of penetrating into, into those um, into those communities. And I guess finally, there is, I think, you know, we do see some metaverse activity. I think that's predominantly within Decentraland. I, I, I know Decentraland pretty well. Uh, and that's kind of a mix between some gambling uh, activity, but also some play to earn activity, things like uh, ice, ice poker. Okay, and you know, Mark, Mark and Robert, both of you work very close and much more on, on the product side specifically. So if you want to talk, t tell me a bit about what you've seen as far as the actual product uh, development, product evolution, maybe the marketing of products that, uh, that really take Web3 and bring it into, into, the, into the gambling space. So yeah, no, eventually to continue on, Stefan was saying, uh, unfortunately, regulations are not that easy at the moment. So 
from a product side and even from a marketing side, I would say businesses and customers are not that easily uh, going out there and building innovative products because the forecast is not that uh, easy for them to get a grip of and it's very challenging. But obviously then from a grey market side, I would say, you know, there's a lot of opportunities going on at the moment. You know, if it's creating NFTs to jump into an online casino itself, you know, we're seeing like... Uh, products like Polka Markets, where you can leverage a token yourself and create your own forecast. Let's say you know what's going to be the weather tomorrow in New York, if it's above 25 or below 25 degrees itself. So there's a new element, uh, how to bet, how to gamble online. And obviously, with these technologies, you know, we're creating a sort of new enhanced stream, um, including gamification, loyalty, community building, which is pretty much key nowadays, especially, you know, with the Gen Z coming into the gambling scene, you know, everyone is looking for that sort of connectivity rather just jumping onto a traditional gaming platform, you know, and looking at the live section, casino section, but they're all into, I would say, quick wins, you know, innovative games where they can connect with. The metaverse is a good example, I would say, as well, but obviously it's not that easy to get into because when it comes to KYC verification customers, we're still very early, so obviously it's very challenging. Sure. Robert? So these are, these are very interesting points, um, and I don't know if any of you have heard of a guy named Nouriel Roubini, who's known in investment circles as Dr. Doom, and I look at our subject of exploring the disruption of Web3 on gambling, I would say from my perspective on regulated gambling, some of the things that you have pointed out I think are very important things to think about that are around the, the perimeter of regulated gambling, but my view is the disruption, if you want to use the word disruption, of Web3 and the metaverse on regulated gambling is basically minimal, uh, if, if at all anything. And I, and I don't think, and I know some of our panelists have views on this that I think are very important, I don't think we're going to see any kind of significant impact on the regulated gambling industry from any of this for a long time. If I look back, I was a guest in May of last year at the uh, Formula One in Miami, which was like, you've just come from there, it's like crypto central as a lot of people know. And a, a friend of mine who uh, owns a, a social gaming company brought me out and a lot of the people looking at these kinds of activities you know, the polygons and various folks looking to try to figure out how they can have a play in regulated gambling. Like, oh, we can do all this stuff and it must be easy and, you know, it, you know, decentralized gambling is just such a great idea because we can track everybody on the blockchain and wouldn't that be interesting for regulators? No. It's just not even close to on the radar screen. And, I, you know, I, I think there's, there's been various... Uh, discussions and consideration of this space by regulators in different jurisdictions. I know, for example, in the UK, it's absolutely a no-go, the relationship between crypto and, and uh, gaming licensing is, is two solitudes for sure. And so I think it's just going to take a real long time, and some of the things that's, that, that have been discussed here are the ways, I think, to have um, this universe make an impact. However, I would say that it's a fiat world uh, in the main, and I would say the other thing that I would think about is that from a product perspective, which was your question, uh, Corey, I mean, you know, you go into Decentraland and you're underwhelmed by the production values, generally. Um, some of the gameplay is the same as what we see on, on game products that you see in regulated gambling, and, you know, s some of that is very straightforward, but, and, and you know, things like ice poker or interesting in of itself, but it's basically an existing kind of product just refashioned into a, a, a different, fairly crude world. And I think any of you have not gone and looked at any of these um, virtual worlds going to Roblox or wherever you want to go and looked at the, the production values and the quality of the, of the games, you'll be underwhelmed. And as much as the space has a lot of potential, it's going to take a long time to, to develop into something. And I think you have to be very careful in thinking you're going to invest a ton of money and change the world solely into regulated gambling. And a, and a final example, which I think people should reflect upon, Meta, formerly Facebook, 
is worth exactly the same amount today as it was five years ago when it began its journey to be the leader in the metaverse. So the metaverse has been a big thud so far. Why should we think that regulated gambling, which is more challenging than any of these worlds, or, or categories, if you will, will have an opportunity sooner than other spaces to make an impact. Well, and you know that that brings up a good point because uh, when you look at you look at Meta, Meta basically shelved a forty-five billion dollar product project to start focusing on AI right now, and um, so you wonder: is it a question on on our end in the in the gambling industry? Is it a question of of capital availability to invest in making it a better product? I mean, if forty billion plus doesn't get you where you need to go, is it a question of putting more money into developing the product so it's something people want to use, or? For us, is it really a question of winning over regulators, finding this comfortable balance, creating the bridge, uh, and then putting, putting that capital in once you know that there's going to be a market there? Which one is sort of a chicken and egg scenario? So Robert, why don't you, why don't you touch on that first? Well, from an investment perspective, um, you know, I, I, because there's been no activity that matches regulated gambling with capital inflows, I, don't, I can't even think of a single thing to describe. But this is where, like the DraftKings NFT <clears throat> example and, uh, and other things, some of the marketing initiatives that you mentioned that are on the periphery, maybe where there's a, you know, free to play is an interesting area that has a parallel where the games are similar. Social, marketing, customer acquisition, some of those areas where you can look at, you know, virtual worlds. But I think where the buck stops is, or no buck stop, is the matter of regulated gambling, ga gaming needs to work in fiat. And that's well, the I, end uh, of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your point is right in a sense that regulation clearly is a massive hurdle, right, for, 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 for gambling. But I, do, I, I just keep coming back to actually, what's the biggest innovation this century in terms of gambling in most industries? It's Web2, right? It's the internet. It's the transition from physical, and it, frankly, quite crudely, taking the physical onto the internet and giving all the benefits of the internet. And, and, and that's you know, created a, a, a massive sector within gambling. But actually has also made it quite a lonely, solitary experience, right? And, and caused, caused problems, I think, as, as a result of that. And we're seeing, and I hear this in a lot of other tracks, you know, this idea of product innovation and socializing and including live chat, including avatars, etc. I think there's a big misunderstanding around the metaverse, right? And I think we're a long way away from a tech point of view to truly getting to what the metaverse is, right? And actually, I think what Zucker did was he probably fired the gun on the hype cycle when actually it's down here, right? We're nowhere near the top of that hype cycle. And it shot all of the very nascent projects, right? And, and the metaverse doesn't have to be attached to Web3. It can be, right, and they could be nascent and, and, uh, or they can be, you know, connected and there's some logic to that connection, but equally it doesn't have to be the case, right? So I, I, I think we need to be clear on, yes, regulation is definitely an issue. I think we also need to be clear on, you know, time frames here because there's lots of other industries and they don't have the regulatory burden that gambling does who are, you know, looking at the metaverse in its broadest sense and saying, well, look, Maybe we should be in Roblox, right? These are the, 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 the fashion industry is a great example, right? Because they see that the generation that's coming up are spending as much money on clothing in digital 3D worlds as they are in, in real life, right? That's a threat. It's an opportunity. But they're also experimenting in some of these Web3-empowered uh, metaverses, knowing full well this is not an ROI, right? This is coming in on the ground level, exper you know, ex experimenting, because they see it as being the future. So uh, for me, I think there's a lot of opportunities for gambling. And actually, I think you know, what will happen, probably as a result, is there's another form of, uh, kind of product and entertainment that takes place alongside gambling and could actually be quite a big threat to gambling. Because as soon as you add a, a monetary component, look at Sorare, for instance. I mean, Sorare raised 350 million, the biggest Series B in European history. Uh, it is in conversation, so we say, with various regulators. And as I said earlier, the, the CEO is actually asking for separate regulation around what they do. But that, to me, is a very, uh, you know, it's very parallel to sports betting, right? 
And if the industry isn't aware to, and open to that, I think there's a, there's a threat there. You know, and it might not be what we know as traditional gambling and traditional gambling games. Well, I mean, and to that point, you know, Mark, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Gen Z, a new generation of player. You know, this next gen of player isn't necessarily going to be coming in looking for the same thing. They, I mean, if we look at behavioral patterns, they're certainly not behaving in the same way traditional, uh, our previous generations of consumers have. And so maybe on a, on a smaller scale, what smaller end, because you know, if we're looking at Web3 as a definition, we're talking some significant broad strokes. We can be discussing anything from NFTs to crypto to the metaverse and everything in between. So what do you think might be some of the, let's say, baby steps or stepping stones uh, on, in the Web3 side that can start to cater to that younger generation of player to, until eventually we're ready to transition them into, uh, into a full Web3 integration on the gambling side? So yeah, no, for sure. So first thing to mention, I would say at the end of the day, the metaverse is, you know, we're very early when it comes to the metaverse. Everyone keeps in mind that the technology and even the devices that 90% of people has doesn't even sustain to go into the metaverse itself. So, you know, if anyone is a Mac user in here, you cannot even load metaverse words. You know, the central end, yes, it's doable, but eventually getting into the real metaverse graphics, if like a metaverse world is built on Unity, for example, where I would say you have a replica, like you're watching a film itself, you know, we're still very early. When it comes to hooking up, I would say, and creating, you know, a virtual world for a business or a brand, a company cannot expect, you know, that much customers coming in. And I see it more as, you know, a new marketing stream to dip your fingers into different audiences and even as well test and absorb what the customer is really after by joining the virtual world itself. You know, let's not forget that Poker Stars had launched their own poker uh, virtual world six, seven years ago. If we had to look at it now, past all these years, they didn't even yet find a way how to monetize it. Why? Because you cannot implement verification between one side to another. So the only way that they had to run it is purely for free. But from another point of view, then eventually when things come up and running, and especially, especially regulation, you know, I'm pretty sure that everyone is already aware of their platform, of their ecosystem, their community that they're trying to build. And I see that a lot of businesses can learn from this and they can start looking into different streams to getting into. Now, obviously, when it comes to the new, I would say, generation that are looking into gambling, you know, everyone is following different marketing streams, especially when it comes to influencers and streaming itself. So that's another opportunity that I, I see across the metaverse world syncing up with Web3, blockchain, AI, and the NFTs. Because at the end of the day, you know, these are all separate. And I would say, you know, it's a big mistake that people have a perspective that Web3 is the metaverse, blockchain, and crypto. But at the end of the day, they're all siloed from one each other. But the nice about it is that if synced well, you know, you can create some quite cool, innovative, tangible products. So, you know what, I just to follow on from your point there, um, there's a member of our audience here called Adam Rosenberg from Blackstone, and he said on the opening panel when he was asked, and I won't quote precisely, what kind of innovative uh, companies are you investing in? And he said something along the lines of innovative companies that can get to cash flow. So I think that this, this is the disciplining feature, and I agree with both of you that that's what we in this panel should be focusing on and generally focusing on. If we look at Web3 and we think about decentralized exchanges as regards regulated gambling, it's probably a waste of time and we shouldn't even go there. NFTs, we can discuss. They're fun and interesting. They're volatile. We can all go to you know, OpenSea and have a good time looking at that and marvel at what people paid for them and marvel at the people who did well on them. And that's wonderful. But I think your comment was, was right. If we focus on, on metaverse as a marketing and accoutrement domain that's complementary to regulated gambling, so, you know, VR, AR, um, different things that, you know, use, use uh, content or data in ways that engage people and support a regulated gaming business, I think that for the assembled is a really interesting space to, to spend time. But, that, but are they businesses in and of themselves focused on this industry or are they extension and leverage 
from something else, um, how solidly can we take those kinds of applications and products and apply them to this sector as standalones? So that's something that always strikes me in, in this space. Yeah. Well, I think, I think one thing to also take into account is uh, the, the nature of, of the gambling industry in itself is that it doesn't really play nicely with the, the entire content, concept of decentralization and oversight. Um, so uh, from a complementary standpoint, where, where are some of the areas where you, where you see that this, these complements, whether they exist now or where they may be able to, to come into play down the line where you may, get, you may get them closer and closer together until eventually you may have a transition or you may have an opportunity. What are some of those, tan, uh, those tangential markets that, uh, that can start to work within the industry? I, I, I think it's complicated, right? And I think it's difficult to kind of predict. But I, I think, to your point, if you look at, you know, decentralized exchanges, casinos, et cetera, which do exist, you know, they, they are out there, there are, there are benefits to them, right? Um, but equally, there are many challenges. And most of those challenges, you know, there's still user experience challenges, et cetera, probably product tech challenges. But, you know, the, those initial kind of pioneering beaters are out there, but even if they are provably fair, right, and they're more secure um, because they're non-custodial, they're not backed by a regulator, <laughs> right? So I might know this, I might believe in it, but I haven't got the regulator. Now, what am I going to go towards? I'm still going to go towards the regulator, right? So that full use of what I would call blockchain technology, I'm with you, I think is a long way out, right? Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I think there are aspects of it, if it's not the entire thing, that could be, um, uh, and I think will be over time, probably taken on board by regulators and operators. But I think we're talking a long time frame. I think the single biggest use case for Web3 is crypto, right? You look at crypto casinos and you look at the volume uh, that they're doing. It's very, very significant. And I think, you know, the other trend then for a regulated market is central bank digital currencies. They are coming, right? They are coming at a pace. There's no question in my mind that in the next three to five years, they will exist, right? And I think they have some advantages. They're very different from crypto for all sorts of industries in terms of efficiency, right? And also for consumers. So, uh, you know, I think this is kind of nuanced and I think there's lots of different layers to it. Some of it is more complicated from a regulatory point of view. Some of it is less. And I add to your point, I think, at least initially, it's probably around the marketing plays yeah. that make most sense. In fact, something that I was going to add, you know, I would say mainly at the moment, the opportunities that are realistically out there is, you know, creating a new loyalty stream, for example, within an NFT collection itself. Obviously, there is casinos that you need to buy into an NFT to get into the platform itself. But as Stefan is mentioning, you know, there isn't any regulation. So if a customer complains, there's no one to turn to. But just the founder of the casino just can take his own action. And let's face it, without any regulations, without, you know, a regulatory body, there isn't that much to follow. You may not even know who the founder is. <laughs> so, yeah, that's another thing. From a crypto side, yeah, I would say it goes hand in hand as well with digital identity, something that we're seeing that is being implemented. Just yesterday I was looking in Australia, they're going to start implementing the dig dig digital identity itself, which will go hand in hand with the CBDC, you know, digital currencies. Right. So every stable coin, most probably that we have currently, you know, USDC, USDT, everything is going to be scrapped. Recently, you know, uh, Paxos cannot mint anymore BUSD for Binance in the US here in New York. So eventually, you know, we're uh, looking at coming years, I would say, regulation, getting things in line. And that's where I see the time is right for the iGaming and gambling industry to start creating, you know, more um, tangible products that they can get into and uh, push to their customers themselves. Well, I think uh, we, we have a couple of minutes left here, and I think that that actually opens up uh, a great segue into, into a final point that I'd like everybody's opinion on, which is, uh, to that point, if we're looking three, five years, if, if, the, if the nearest projection is saying that sometime in the next decade, but certainly not for the next five years or so, uh, is this a conversation that is happening too early, or is it a, a circumstance where you have to have the conversation five years in advance so that you can prepare yourself future-proof against this coming tide, assuming 
that uh, there's no major shift. So, Robert, why don't you uh, start with start us well, off Well, uh, Stefan uh, put it very well with keep an eye on digital currencies. Keep an, I mean, right now, with the mess of the crypto world and, the you know, we've all followed the FDX and on down carnage that's playing out in front of us. But as we get into a stable coin environment in parallel with um, digital currencies, in parallel with gaming regulators having a better understanding of the blockchain and how to understand that and manage that and you know the data world that we're in today given the rapid development of AI applications and services I mean maybe chat GPT could have had this panel in fact um, <laughs> the way that, that. <laughs> <laughs> will all be supplanted by I, uh, you know I think that uh, these are the things that I would I would look at because capital is not going to flow into something with such high risk and no prospect of sure. returns. Mark? Yeah, eventually uh, I stick, you know, to I, as I was mentioning before, um, it's good that we stay realistic and see exactly what can be done. And obviously it all falls down to regulation and how each uh, state or market itself will regulate in sync to it. Because at the end of the day, you know, every market, every state has its own regulation. It's like we have currently in iGaming in Europe, you know, we have UK, we have Sweden, we have different uh, regulators, and all of them we need to abide to if it's loyalty, marketing, VIP. So, you know, at the end of the day, crypto is going to be a big part of all of this. I see everything is going to be moving digitally, including our own um, identities, which I see it will disrupt the verification and KYC process. But on the other hand, I would see it much more easier to integrate, you know, verification if each one of us will have his own digital identity that we can hook up and obviously verify automatically through AI, machine learning, and so on. Sure. Stefan, close us out. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic. I mean, I think I'm a, a prag pragmatist as well. I, I think there are opportunities. I think, you know, history has shown us that first movers benefit. I get it. Operators have a lot on their plate. Uh, they're looking at lots of things. They're dealing with lots of things. But I think, you know, it's remiss if at least, you know, the kind of innovation teams within the operators and, and increasingly, I think, the marketing teams are not looking and experimenting um, with some of this tech. Well, thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you all for being here. Hope you enjoyed yourselves and learned something. Thank you.